Sounds good. Hi, everybody. I'm keenly aware that it's a beautiful sunny Friday afternoon. We're on day two of the conference, and maybe some of you are thinking about that cold beer that you're going to enjoy <laughs> in this spectacular city. But um, Eleanor and I are really excited to talk to you about our work together. So uh, we're going to get started. By way of introduction, uh, thank you for that, Chris. Uh, my name is Judy Mellet. I head up the service design team at TELUS. And it's not working? Oh, OK. And um, for those of you who've come from abroad, TELUS is a major national service provider here in Canada, supplying internet, TV, mobility, home security, and health services to Canadians. And my team and I have the good fortune of being able to work with internal partners to improve customer experiences for our products and services, as well as deliver positive business outcomes. Thanks, Judy. Thanks, Judy. And uh, I feel like a total fraud being up here, especially with service design royalty. Uh, I am first and foremost an educator. I spent 20 years of my career in the classroom teaching uh, math and science. Raise your hand if those were your favorite subjects in school. Yes. <laughs> I now work for the Ministry of Education, uh, where I lead a team of IT professionals, um, application specialists, and network architects. And I'm really delighted to be here today. Um, when Judy told me we were the last people, or second to last people on the schedule, I thought, few, because education conferences, teachers don't stay past 3.30. So uh, I'm really surprised you're all here. <laughs> Um, before we talk about our big problem in education, I want to just give you a little bit of a context of, and talk a little bit about where I'm from. Um, yesterday, we all had the privilege of seeing some absolutely fantastic photographs and hearing about the wonderful experience on Fogo Island. I'm from the other side, uh, the west coast of Canada. British Columbia is a large province. Its land mass is uh, England, Germany, and France all together. Uh, most of it is uninhabited. We're nestled between the Pacific Ocean and the Rocky Mountains. Um, about four and a half million or so uh, inhabitants, and most of them are on the southern border with the US. Um, we are diverse, very diverse population. 30% of our population comes from somewhere other than uh, Canada, uh, speak a variety of languages. We have 222,000 indigenous people in our province, and we are working hard to uh, deal on a nation-to-nation -nation basis with them. Um, we have a very diverse um, geography. We have coastal communities where you can only fly in or get in by boat. We have remote mountainous villages. We have uh, the northern part of our province, which is very prairie-like. And based all the, on the oil industry, we have the interior, which is uh, the, sort of like the northern Napa Valley, and lots of wine producers. And then we have a very urban environment. A little bit about the school system. Um, those of you who are not from Canada, every province has its own system. And in our province, we have 60 different school districts, each with um, an elected school board that sort of runs the operations. Um, our school districts are varied. We have a number in the Lower Mainland and, and Lower Vancouver Island, which are quite urban. Then we have a lot up north that are large, but with very few students. Our, our biggest school district is uh, Stikine, in the center of the province, and it has uh, 159 students, and it's as big as uh, England and Wales put together. So it gives you some idea that the sparseness and the, the, the challenges we have in BC of putting an equitable and accessible system across the whole province. We have small schools, only five students, and we have large schools with over 2,000. So um, despite all that, we are actually recognized by OECD as one of the top 10 jurisdictions um, in terms of education around the world. Our students do really well on international tests, 80% uh, of the kids that start kindergarten do graduate, and 75% of those go on to some form of post-secondary education. So we are justifiably proud. So what's the problem? Raise your hand if you know what this is. <laughs> Nobody? <laughs> it's a classroom. <laughs> and unfortunately, education 
has not changed a whole lot since this photograph was taken. Um, our students are graduating and they are getting higher and higher GPAs, but they are feeling less and less prepared for the world that they're entering. Um, we have done an absolutely fantastic job of educating our kids for the past and not the future, and that was the problem. So the big issue, students told us, we're not finishing our K-12 with the skills and competencies and knowledge that we need for success as we move forward into a knowledge-based economy into the 21st century. Our grads are gonna have massive changes in, in what they're facing. Um, for me, it was easy. I graduated in the 70s, rolled on to university, got a job, it was great. I didn't have to face the kind of challenges that they will be. Massive um, population disruption, climate change, globalization, lots of technical disruption. And so it becomes obvious that maybe um, Knowing how to factor a polynomial equation or memorizing Avogadro's number, sorry for those of you who are having flashbacks to high school algebra, um, maybe they're not that important and, and we can do better. So what do we do? Um, in BC, we, we took a look at our curriculum. We consulted with some other leading jurisdictions. We looked at places where um, students were having success, feeling better about their education. And we did a massive redesign of our curriculum, which is what students have to know, do, and understand by the time they finish high school. Um, we looked and we thought, pe people used to get these giant binders. I'm waving things around here. It's hard for me not to talk with my hands. Um, people used to get these giant binders as teachers with six, 700 pages of this is what you have to cover in this course. There's all kinds of learning standards and learning outcomes your students should be able to do this and this and this by the time you finish. And it didn't leave much thought or time to do anything different. So we really stripped that away, went and looked at what are the big ideas, what are the core competencies that we want our students to graduate with, and they are things like critical thinking, creativity, personal and social responsibility, and communication. So we worked really hard. We uh, got this curriculum together. We redesigned it. We just finished and put 11 and 12 up online uh, this September. So we finished it all. But putting something up on a web page, that doesn't really do anything. We actually need to figure out how do you make this live in the classroom? And we had no idea. So for that, someone suggested, well, why don't you use a service design approach? And all I knew about that was that you use a lot of post-it notes and people wear really cool clothes. So, uh, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Judy because we gave the challenge to her. <laughs> okay, thanks, Eleanor. I, I'm guessing I don't need this. this sounds like I'm double might. Okay. Okay, um, so that gives a really great context, hopefully, of what's happening in the province of British Columbia and specifically in the education sector. Behind me is yet another picture of bridge. Um, I know you've seen a lot of pictures of bridges, but this is Lionsgate Bridge, and it's a beautiful night shot here in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this year's conference theme for our project is also perfect because it reflects bringing people together from the world of design, from technology, government, all with the purpose to try and transform education in order to help students be better prepared for future success. So I'm just gonna pick up where Eleanor left off. Um, how we came to be involved in this project is one day I got a call at my desk from one of our TELUS account managers. She explains to me that her role is looking after government partnerships. And the tel TELUS and the Ministry of Education were partnering together to help advance the ministry's innovation mandate through technology. And one of the things that among the requests that, <laughs> that the ministry had, one is that they wanted to use service design to help affect the outcomes. And she'd never heard of service design, she didn't know that TELUS had a service design team. And in fact, it was somebody from the ministry who said, we know there's a team in Toronto and we suggest that you reach out. So it's always a little bit embarrassing when somebody externally is telling you about somebody internally in your organization, but that's how she came to call on me. And of course, I was 
starting to get really excited and intrigued. And one of the first questions I asked was, so what's the problem that we're working on together? And she tells me and reads to me the problem statement that Eleanor just described, that students weren't feeling prepared coming out of school uh, for today's economy. And all I was thinking was, holy crap. <laughs> What am I get myself into here? Um, but then I also remind myself, just trust the process. And so we dove in. And one of the first things in order, of course, is to establish who our stakeholders are. And we had an immediate team. It was Eleanor's team, our TELUS account team. Garth is here um, from the account team. And it was my service design team and the lovely folks from OXD, a local Vancouver service design agency that we partnered with. And that was well in hand. Then we started to look to who else in ministry do we need to involve? So there were people who looked after rural strategy, urban strategy, curriculum, career and trades planning, policy. This is just to name a few. Then we started to think about outside the ministry. And we needed representation from First Nations education, from the BC Superintendents Association, BC Teachers Federation. So this stakeholder map was starting to look pretty big. And of course, most importantly, we had to include students, right? All students, teachers. We wanted to ensure that we also had pre-service teachers, so those are just graduated from college. And we also want to have voices outside education. So we look to people from organizations such as the Science Center and Vancouver Aquarium. So we kept revisiting the stakeholder map and we're adding to it throughout the, uh, the whole project. And that was one of the first things I learned, that when you're designing in public sector, inclusivity is an imperative. And that is why service design was chosen as the process to be used, because its philosophy of inclusion aligns so well with the public sector. Since we were driving transformation, we also had to identify the change agents. Uh, so those are people who are already bought into the case for change. We have educators who are trying new pedagogical methods and sharing it within their network. But believe it or not, there's also change agents within government. And so we wanted to identify who they were and bringing them into the process. I remember being pleasantly surprised one of our early meetings, we were talking about constraints and we talked about regulatory constraints and the policy person said, why? The last time I checked, policy are just ideas and words and those can be changed. So this is why having change agents are really important because you can get faster and further than if you had the project without them. So this map behind me shows just what we covered both geographically and across the different groups, and that's just during the service design portion. We partnered with IBM. They took over from the development phase, and they since added to this. So we continually were adding bridges, um, reaching out as, as we were throughout the course of this project, as we were progressing. And we have some incredible memories um, to share. Uh, we keep drawing on them over and over again. I just remember being awestruck, uh, visiting the uh, school on Seabird Island. So it had an open architecture design that reflects its community-based approach to learning. And that reflects the um, First Nations principles of learning that Eleanor talked about. There were some funny stories too. I see Deb here. Um, we had some researchers who got a flat tire when they were coming back from obs uh, classroom observation. And this is back on the logging roads in some remote territory. And what just struck, it was probably not funny at the time, but it was, we, we should to laugh about it afterwards. Um, and what struck me as we were traversing across the province, just how vast the differences are in where and when and how learning takes place in this province. And of course, the most compelling memories are from the conversations we had, like real dialogue with people. So not research, not interviewer to interviewee. We were asking teachers and librarians and vice principals what they were thinking about on their drive home from work. And one of the themes that came up continually was this need for connections. And if you think about it, um, a, a being a teacher can feel isolating, right? They spend most of their day in a classroom alone with their students and without any peer support. And if you think about the more extreme example of someone who's just come out of teacher's college, they're assigned to a school in a rural district, and um, they haven't developed their network yet. And on top of that, if you combine that with the revised curriculum, which really puts an emphasis on inquiry-based learning. So that means students are driving their own topics that they're interested in in order to develop the curricular competencies like critical thinking, creativity, problem solving. And so if a teacher is not well-versed in topics such as water conservation or reconciliation, that can be a challenge, right? 
It's no longer the school model that we went to where the teacher was the expert in all subject areas and their job was to impart knowledge to the students. Hearing from the students, of course, want to talk about what stood out for them when they're in school. And we heard a ton of stories about teachers who helped them achieve success, overcome hardship, understand a concept that was particularly challenging for them. And again, a theme kept cropping up over and over again, and it was about students wanting more choice and flexibility and options. And when they got that, they really were more invested in their education. And this gave them a sense of having more control. And so if I were to put the whole project on a slide, which maybe seems too nice and tidy, and I'm sure the OXD folks and all the other folks in the room who are working on this project would say it doesn't reflect the kind of peaks and valleys uh, that you have on any service design project. Um, and I'm not trying to discount that we had those as, as we do with any project. But this is it in a nutshell. So there are 16 distinct opportunity areas that were gleaned from a 900 original findings. Um, then the team worked really hard to deliberate on not just the seven priorities that we wanted to focus on, but the criteria by which we were going to figure out what those seven priorities are. And they were what I've talked about. So students feeling more engaged in their learning by having more flexibility and choice. For educators, it was about having more connections to mentors and other educators. And because we do live in a digital world, do, like taking the best advantage of all that technology has to offer. And then from that, we distilled it down to three co-creation challenges, and the designers in the room would understand these are the how might we statements that we took into the workshops. How might we enable teacher empowerment, learning, and growth? How might we enable connections with community members and mentors and experts? And for students, how do we ensure that there's equitable and flexible access to education? And coming out of the co-creation workshops, there were a number of ideas. We distilled them into distinct concepts. And then we made some tough decisions over a series of weeks and months uh, before we finally chose one service that we thought that best reflected the objectives for this project that we wanted to go forward with and take into prototyping. And that's Shared BC. So the whole aim of Shared BC is to be able to connect educators not only with one another, but also connect them to local and global community experts. And they can do things like share learning resources, co-design lesson plans, talk about what's worked and not worked in, in terms of what they're trialing out in their classrooms. It could also connect them to experts who have knowledge that they don't in specific subject areas. And if we do this really well, and if it's done well, what we can do is we can help alleviate situations where we hear teachers, they're up late at night, they're trying to hunt for, on the internet for resources. Maybe it's a topic like the decline bee population. They're looking at a YouTube video and they're about 18 minutes in, realize all of a sudden, uh-oh, there's something here that's not you know, appropriate for the grade three classroom. And, um, and we're hoping to address situations like that. And there's also situations we heard, the grade 10 math teacher, um, he's trying flipped teaching method. I keep saying inverted. Is it? What's it? Flip, flipped classroom. And what he's doing is he's videotaping his classroom instruction and he's assigning that to his students for homework. And then the homework, as we would traditionally know it as, is being done in the classroom where he felt the applied portion of the learning is what the students needed most support with. And what was happening is other teachers were finding out about it and they're connecting with him and asking, first, can you share the videos? And then can you respond to me and tell me what's worked, uh, what have you been doing, how do you actually do this properly? And he was struggling to be able to respond to all these requests. So Shared BC is meant to address that, right? So being able to broaden his reach and being able to share, share what he's doing, but also benefit from other teachers who are trying this flipped classroom and learning from what they're doing. So it's broadening the network and the reach for educators. So um, as we move forward, IBM's continue to reiterate and refine uh, Shared BC as it prepares for its imminent launch. Um, I was thinking about, especially as we put this talk together, um, there's so many things I learned throughout this, but I was trying to distill it down to some of the few key things. One, I would say I do, obviously, the majority of my work in the private sector, I do it with Intellis. And I was comparing just some of what I've learned in design working in the public sector. And I would say, um, one, it scales in the public sector. And perhaps that's obvious, it's much more complex, there's a lot more people involved. Um, but it scales exponentially, right? 
And I don't mean to diminish the work that we do at TELUS. It's pretty complex too, right? We're dealing with some wicked problems. There's complex business systems, lots of business units. Um, they have conflicting objectives or varying objectives that we need to try and align to. Um, but when you're in public sector, your pursuit of economic and social goals makes it that much more magnified, the impact that you can have, right? Especially in education, where you're trying to address knowledge inclusion, iron out social inequalities, and you're trying to improve the future quality of life for citizens. Secondly, I'd say that we have the big macro goal on how do we ensure student success. And as we progress the project, a lot of sub-goals came into light, so edu instilling educated confidence through connections was one. Then as Share at BC as a service became established, there were other goals, right? And they're more tactical, and they're service-specific. They're things like, I remember we sat and talked about what are the attributes you want to include in the educator and community member profiles. They can be UX or kind of um, interaction-based type discussions that you're having and then setting KPIs against them. And what's really important is that you're linking these goals to one another because it's really easy to lose the plot line when you're arguing some UX-based decisions that you're making and you can lose sight of the bigger picture. And that's particularly true in this project where you had distributed stakeholders. You have to remember we're working in education calendar year, so there's large swaths of time where we haven't met, you know, summer break, winter break, March breaks. So you need to always make those linkages to the broader picture and keep them well in hand. Lastly, I'd say find your lighthouses. So as one team member said, um, Everyone knows who the lighthouses are, right? They don't have to have formal titles. You walk into any school and everyone will point to the same person or people. And these lighthouses are the contributors to your service, right? They're going to inform the service. They're the ones that are going to give it credibility within their network. Um, and if you think about it, they're the service itself, right? Because we're relying on them to contribute their knowledge and assets in order to make the service. So, so you need to find out like, the what's in it for me first for the contributors before you're trying to suss out the end consumers or the consumers of the content that's in shared BC through the connections and resources. So before I pass it back over to Eleanor, I just want to take this opportunity, because I don't get to see her very often, just to say how fortunate I feel to have been able to work on this. I learned so much. And really, it's reaffirmed for me the nobility of people who work in, in public sector, right? We're entrusting our kids um, with educators. They bear an enormous responsibility. And definitely, from a design perspective, it's reaffirmed my belief in what service design can do. It can positively impact and drive social outcomes. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. No, I think you need that. I don't, think, I don't think my thing is working, so I'll have to go like this again. Um, thank you, Judy. And um, I, I really learned a lot as well from this process. I learned that you're more than just post-its and, and cool clothes, for sure. Um, but I, I really learned also to trust the process. And I wanted to give you a couple of tips, sort of as, as you may be working for government, on, on what you might want to think about um, having been through this process. First of all, never underestimate the ignorance of the public service at times. We think we're into service design, but we're not. And I say that, hopefully my boss is not here. Um, <laughs> uh, but we really don't know much about it. And, and I think you really do need to take the time to educate your client about the process, prepare them for the ambiguity that's gonna happen at the beginning. Um, we're not comfortable with risk and we're not comfortable with uncertainty as public servants sometimes. So we really have to be coached to take that step and, and trust the process. The other piece is to understand the politics. And I do mean big P and little p politics. Um, what you'll find is government is much more interested in new project and innovation in the first year of their mandate than they are in the last year of their mandate. Um, that's when they want to just keep things stable and don't make too many changes. Um, the other piece is the financial cycles. You know, there's, there's the same sort of thing. There, there's money to spend at the beginning and, and not so much at the end. It's being held. So you might have a great idea. You might even get your project almost ready to launch and it can be cut. So it's not because it was a bad project, it was just because policies changed. Know who the decision makers are in the office. If there is a hierarchy and government is hierarchical, you need to know who you need to influence or what you need to do to provide your client with the material they need to influence the, the stakeholders. But um, I'm really delighted that we actually got this to the beta phase, which is 
happening now. We're going to be launching with a bunch of teachers next week. And what does it look like? Um, it's pretty intuitive. It's what they wanted. And there's a, an area for them to post a little bit about themselves, share their resources, comment about the resources. And what they were really looking for was something that reminded them of Pinterest, reminded them of, um, of uh, Facebook and Tinder for Teacher, whatever you want. But it's just that making those connections. So I think, though, I'd like to let the last word go with the people that helped create this and what kind of an impact um, Share It is going to have on them and being part of the design process. So um, I'd like you to hear from our teachers. I think that there's so much amazing work that's being done across the province, but we don't know about it. So especially because we're trying to indigenize the curriculum and bridge those gaps, there's this now opportunity for us to make those connections with people that we otherwise would not have been connected to. For me personally, I'm a new teacher. So this is really a great tool for me to build my resource bank because when you graduate, they don't give you a booklet of resources. So this is an amazing way to um, build that bank, but also when you're looking for resources online, they're not always um, in BC. I think access to models and examples will be key for teachers because you can read the new curriculum, but now you can actually see it coming to life. I think that the more examples we have will help teachers to build and create a new mental model for teaching and learning. This can go huge big picture. So right now it's based in BC and we'll connect all those different districts. I think it has the potential to then reach um, other provinces. So knowing that we're trying to build those connections and collaboration, I think that it's a really great way to unite different groups. The uh, possibilities of this service, I see as a way to uh, give teachers a resource that lets them easily locate, and that's the key part, easily and efficiently locate resources, which are people, uh, lesson plans, videos, live stream events that are going to help them support where we're going with the Transform curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> oh.